Okay. All right. So, mm, is that okay? Sounds fine. Okay. So these are going to be uh, uh, lectures about conformal field theory, and um, um, I think I'll I'll try to demonstrate the methods and the results on the example of the three D Ising model because this was already discussed yesterday, so it's going to uh, to be easy to follow. So let's consider the 3D easing model. And uh, as Ettore discussed yesterday, this model has a critical point. And uh, usually in statistical physics literature, one studies these critical exponents, and in particular one studies uh, these exponents nu and eta. And from my perspective, these uh, critical exponents, they are going to be related uh, to two particular operators, which the easing model going to have. So there's going to be two local operators. Uh, sigma of x and epsilon of x. So by local operators, I mean that one can measure correlation functions of these operators. And in particular, they are, uh, if you look at their two-point correlation functions, so for example, a two-point correlation function, sigma of x, sigma of y, then uh, at the critical point, I'm only going to consider the critical point in the lectures. This is going to go as 1 over uh, x minus y to the power 2 delta sigma. And this number, uh, so this allows me to introduce this number delta sigma, which is called scaling dimension. So it's very important that uh, the critical point, as uh, as Ettore explained, it's a fixed point of randomization group flow. And since it's a fixed point, it has uh, scale invariance. So if you rescale all the distances by, by the same factor, then uh, the physics uh, of the fixed point doesn't change. So all correlation functions are going to get rescaled again by some fixed factor. And so this explains why we have this power law dependence at the critical point. So there are these uh, dimensions delta sigma, delta epsilon. And in terms of these dimensions, I can write these critical exponents. So nu is going to be equal to 1 over uh, 3 minus delta epsilon. And eta is going to be equal to 2 delta sigma minus 1. So if you study uh, the critical exponents nu and eta, then you are secretly studying the scaling dimensions of these two operators, sigma and epsilon. Uh, but of course, uh, this uh, critical point is going to have many more operators. It's not going to have operators sigma and epsilon, but it's going to have infinitely many operators. So, uh, in a sense, it's interesting to view this theory as a whole and to view all of its operators together and not to focus specifically just on these two operators, right? Uh, but still, uh, there is a reason also why these two operators are special, sigma and epsilon. These operators are special because these are uh, the only two operators which have dimensions smaller than 3. So these are uh, the only two relevant operators. Which means that their scaling dimension is less than, I said 2, less than 3. Uh, less than 3. 
By the way, three, of course, comes from the fact that I'm dealing with three-dimensional easing model. If it was in a different number of dimensions, this would change. Uh, so, um, so all other operators of the theory are going to have dimension bigger than three. Yes. This is not going to be important for uh, for my course. So if you don't know it, don't don't worry. Uh, this is just to connect with uh, with the lectures of Ettore. On the other hand, delta epsilon, delta sigma are going to be very important, and so this I'm going to explain in detail. But uh, so by the way, sometimes sometimes when you do uh, when you do randomization group studies, then you call this operator sigma, you call it phi. And operator epsilon you call phi squared because in uh, in perturbative quantum field theory we just have one fundamental field phi and all other operators are made out of phi. Uh, however, in in my lectures we are not going to take perturbative approach, so we are going to take non-perturbative approach, and uh, from this non-perturbative point of view. Uh, it makes it's impossible to view these operators as made out of something. So we are going to view them as uh, fundamental entities. So sigma is going to be a fundamental object. Epsilon is going to be just as fundamental object in conformal field theory. Uh, so so we are not going to use we are not going to rely on this phi phi squared identification in in our course. So now let me let me state some results just as an appetizer. So I'm going to describe eventually this method, which is called conformal bootstrap. And using this method, uh, the following results can be obtained for these critical exponents. So I'm going to, to write them with many digits in, uh, in all glory. So eta is equal 0 0.036298 uh, and uh, nu is equal 0 0.629 nine <coughs> So this is with rigorous error bars. So there are no, uh, so, so this uncertainty is completely uh, rigorous. It's uh, what, I'm, what I mean by that is that I'm going to confront it with the Monte Carlo results. So eta Monte Carlo is equal to 0 0.0 three six eight two and new Monte Carlo is equal to zero point six three zero zero two ten. But this is uh, one sigma error bars. Because there's some statistical uncertainty uh, which which uh, you do when you do Monte Carlo simulation. So these results, these Monte Carlo results are by themselves about a factor uh, uh, 10 to 100 more precise than, uh, than the renormalization group calculations. And as you see, uh, the conformal bootstrap results are about, uh, so here it's factor, factor 100 more precise, and here it's uh, factor 250. So, uh, so they are extremely precise. So these conformal bootstrap results are extremely precise. Uh, probably uh, the most precise results that have ever been obtained about uh, quantum field theory in three dimensions, uh, which is not a free theory. Which is not a free theory. So. Uh, but of course, you know, precision is good, precision is good, but what I would like to emphasize is that 
uh, it's not just precision, which is important here, but it's just this conformal bootstrap is a completely new way uh, to deal with the theory, so which gives which gives you a new perspective on how you are supposed to control the theory. And it is because of this new perspective that you reach uh, a, a new level of understanding and a new level of precision. So that's why, that's why it's interesting. And uh, another relevant comment is that, okay, here I'm talking about the 3D easing model, but uh, the method is, is general. So it applies not just to the 3D easing, but it applies to ON models, and it applies to all sorts of other critical points which are more complicated. So it's a, it's a general technique. And that's what we are going to discuss in this course. Yeah, I wrote the numbers. So what is important here, uh, I wrote the numbers to impress you clearly, right? So, uh, so the only important thing is the number of digits. Uh, yes. 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 In fact, in fact, in fact, uh, in fact, of course, uh, the way we compute them is in terms of delta sigma and delta epsilon. Right. Any other comments? All right. So the crucial, the crucial thing which makes everything possible is that uh, the critical point of 3D easing model has conformance. So let me explain what this means. So we are going to be considering we are going to be considering correlation functions of local operators. So some objects like O1, X1, and so on, O N, Xn. So conformal invariance is going to be formulated as some uh, invariance properties of these correlation functions under conformal transformations. So I'm going to define what these conformal transformations are. But let me first of all uh, state the obvious things. So first of all, uh, of course, we are going to have uh, in at the critical point, we are going to have Poincaré invariance. So that's that's clear. So which means invariance under translations and rotations. That's, I hope that's, uh, that's fine with everyone. Uh, so we can express Poincaré invariance in, uh, in terms of invariance under finite translations and rotations, but we can also express it as it's uh, normally done in quantum field theory uh, by invariance under inf infinitesimal transformation. So we, we are going to introduce these generators, uh, P mu, uh, which acting on an operator O at point X uh, gives me a derivative of the same operator. And I'm going to introduce also a generator M mu nu, which acting on operator OX is going to give me uh, X mu D nu minus X mu D mu. 
plus s mu nu times the operator of x. So here, this matrix s mu nu, so if the operator is a scalar operator, then I just have the, uh, the first part, uh, the spatial part, but if the operator O has some indices, if it's a, if it's a tensor under a rotation group, then this matrix S mu nu acts on its indices. So the way I should write it is that here I have an index A, suppose it's a vector operator, like a current, then this matrix S mu nu has, uh, has also two indices, A, B, Is this clear what this matrix S menu is supposed to do? Or should I explain it better? Okay, seems to be clear. So we have these two infinitesimal, uh, we have these two infinitesimal uh, generators, P mu and M menu, which express invariance under uh, Poincaré. But yes. Uh, well, I'm, I'm doing, so since I'm interested in the three-dimensional easing model, three-dimensional easing model lives in the three-dimensional Euclidean space. So, uh, so here M mu nu is a generator of the rotation group of the three-dimensional Euclidean space. So it's rotation invariance in, in 3D. Uh, but you know, if I consider a Minkowski version of the same model, then it's going to be Lorentz invariance. But in this course, I'm going to be dealing uh, with Euclidean space exclusively. Any other questions? So, so that's Poincaré. Then another thing, another invariance that, that we should be comfortable with is invariance under dilatations or scale invariance. So this also comes as no surprise, uh, as, as I said, uh, since we have a fixed point of organization group, it is scale invariant. Uh, and it means that we are going to have another generator, another generator, and this generator is usually called D. So when, you, when this generator acts on uh, the field of X, it gives you uh, X mu d mu plus delta O of x, where delta is the scaling dimension of the field O. By the way, I say sometimes field, sometimes operator is just synonymous. I hope it's not confusing. Um, so this is an infinitesimal transformation is infinitesimal transformation. But we can also consider a finite transformation. So we, if we exponentiate the section of the generator on the field O, then uh, we are going to get the, fo the following finite transformation. The finite transformation is going to be x going to lambda x. And then we have uh, this, uh, the transformed field O prime of X is equal uh, to lambda to the delta O of lambda X. And invariance under the scale transformation simply means that, that the transformed field O prime of X, O prime of Y has the same correlation functions as, as the original field. O X O Y. This is the content of scale invariance, and as you remember, I told you that this uh, two-point correlation function is equal to one over X minus Y uh, to the power two d to delta. And uh, as you see, this form of correlation function is invariant under this transformation of the field O. So it's uh, it's uh, all as it should be.
so we have uh, we have Poincaré invariance, we have scale invariance, and uh, we have yet another generator. We have yet another vector field. So here I have to erase something. Well, I can erase this part. So all these transformations form part of conformal transformations, but the most interesting one, it will come from another uh, generator, which we will call k mu. And this generator is in, uh, in correspondence with the vector field, let me call it k, sm k small mu, which is given by uh, x mu x d x dx, Tw twice, I think, minus x squared d mu. So we have this. Uh, so, so this generator is going to be associated with this vector field in the same sense as the dilatation generator was associated with this field x mu d mu, which is the the, f the vector field which generates dilatations. Right. Uh, so actually, we, ha we had this vector field p mu, which was just d mu. We had mu mu, which was x mu d mu uh, minus x mu d mu. And we had the vector field d, which was x times x dx. And, and now we have the full, uh, the full algebra of uh, vector fields generating conformal transformations. So so what is special about this uh, what is special about this vector fields? And why so I have to explain why are we going to get this extra generator k mu. So this extra generator we we are, we are seeming to get basically for free. So yes. It's there's going to be a spin part, and it's going to be expressible in terms of the same matrix uh, S mu nu, which was responsible for which was responsible for uh, for the rotation transformations, uh, and there's going to be delta as well. Yeah, delta will also enter. So this is an I this is indeed a very interesting uh, question. So why are you going to get this uh, this extra generator and in order I'm sorry uh, no the first three generators would be closed yeah so um no, by adding this generator, you really enlarge the algebra. Because, because uh, this generator D, by itself, it doesn't do much. It, I mean, the, if you don't add k mu, then the algebra looks like Poincaré times dilatations. And they are completely decoupled. They do, not, uh, they do not do anything interesting with each other. So you are not going to get k mu. So it's really a, an interesting uh, new ingredient, this generator k mu, that you are going to get. And uh, in order to understand this, uh, so there are, there are various ways to understand this. So let I'll, I'll explain two ways, uh, one physical and one more mathematical. So uh, the physical, so let's start with the physical way. So what is the defining property of this uh, algebra of vector fields? So all these vector fields, as we are going to see, they satisfy uh, the following equation. So we are going to have this uh, vector field epsilon mu, which is one of this, uh, k, p, m, d. And this vector field satisfies the following equation, 
d mu epsilon nu uh, plus d nu epsilon nu is equal uh, to some cons to some function times delta mu nu. And by taking the trace of this equation, you get that this function c is equal to 1 over d uh, times the divergence of epsilon, where d is equal to 3. So there is this equation. It's called conformal killing equation. So actually, as an exercise, please check. So this, is, this would be the exercise. So I'm going to, from time to time, I'm going to give exercises. And maybe later in the afternoon, I'm going to send an email containing some more exercises. So this is uh, for those who would like to follow this course in detail and who would like to, to make an exam in the end. Uh, so please do this exercises. So check this equation. And actually, uh, this is the full list of vector fields which satisfy this equation in three dimensions. So in two dimensions, there are additional vector fields because in, in two dimensions, conformal transformations are infinite dimensional, but in, uh, in any number of dimensions bigger or equal than three, this is the full list of vector fields. <coughs> so in this course, we are not going to, uh, to deal with the two-dimensional case. Now, uh, so let me, uh, let me express the physical content of this uh, equation in the following way. So I'm going to consider, so, I'm, so since it's a vector field, that means that I'm considering infinitesimal transformation, x prime mu is equal to x, x mu plus epsilon mu. And let me consider the Jacobian, uh, so dx prime mu dx nu. So, uh, So this is equal to um, this is equal to delta mu nu plus d mu epsilon nu. And I would like to write it. I would like to write it in a in a slightly different form. So I would like to write it as follows. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, delta delta nu epsilon nu. So, so if. So under the assumption that this conformal killing equation is satisfied, this can be written as uh, 1 plus 1 over d, uh, d epsilon times delta mu nu plus 1 half d nu epsilon mu minus d mu epsilon nu. So this is under the assumption of conformal killing. You see, because I, so here I added this term, d mu epsilon nu, in order to make this anti-symmetric, but I can express d mu epsilon nu through d nu epsilon nu <coughs> at the price of adding this part. And here I added this part, here. So this is just a rewrite. 
But now we see the following interesting structure. So this matrix here, this matrix here, so it's delta mu plus something antisymmetric. And this matrix is thus uh, represents at every point of space time a small rotation. So this is infinitesimal, infinitesimal x dependent rotation. And, and this is just a factor an x-dependent factor, and so this represents an infinitesimal x-dependent dilatation. Dilatation of scale transformation. So we see that, uh, that the conformal transformation, at least infinitesimal conformal transformation, it's, uh, it's a composition of infinitesimal rotation and infinitesimal dilatation. So if we now exponentiate our conformal transformations and consider finite conformal transformations, then, of course, this property is going to, uh, to remain true. So for finite, for finite transformations, you know, if you pass from algebra to the group, uh, it's going to be true that uh, dx prime mu over dx nu is equal to some function omega of x times uh, r mu nu of x uh, where r is an orthogonal matrix so And finally, uh, so, so this is, so, so conformal transformations can be defined in various equivalent ways. One way is to define it through this conformal killing equation. Another way, which is equivalent, which we derived now, is to, to start from this property that it's a for finite transformations. And finally, we can consider uh, yet uh, another definition which is to say that conformal transformations, they uh, transform the metric of Euclidean space, ds squared, to another metric, ds prime squared, which is equal to, which is proportional to the original metric. So omega squared of x, ds squared. So in order to get this equation, we just take uh, we just use this Jacobian and contract it with the delta function and we're going to get this. Right, so all these three definitions, they are equivalent. I did not fully demonstrate their equivalence. I only demonstrated implication in one direction, but they're equivalent. So this was mathematics, but now let's get back to physics. The fact that conformal transformation can be viewed as x-dependent rotations times x-dependent dilatation, physically, this can be interpreted uh, as a sort of non-uniform RG transformation. So uh, normally, when you do RG transformation, uh, you do this blocking. You take, say, spin variables, and then you put them in blocks of size two times two times two, and then you, do the, you repeat this blocking again and again and again, right? And you choose the size of the blocks the same everywhere. And you get a fixed point of randomization group if the Hamiltonian doesn't change. And then we argued that if you have a fixed point, then you have scale invariance, and we argued for scale transformation. Now, you can imagine a more general randomization group transformation in which uh, you choose the size of blocks differently in different points of space. So here you block two by two, there you block three, three times three, and so on. Uh, so it's, uh, 
conceivable that if your model is invariant under the usual uh, uniform blocking, then it will also be invariant under this more general blocking where you choose blocks non-uniformly. So if you take this assumption, which is a physical assumption, then uh, you arrive at the conclusion that your model should be invariant not only under scale transformations, but also under this more general conformal transformations. So this is the physics argument. Uh, so I don't uh, want to claim that this is 100% uh, rigorous, but I think it gives some intuition behind these conformal transformations. But since it's not fully rigorous, I'm now going to give a more mathematical argument. So these equations we will still need later on. It's good. So now we're going to give a more mathematical argument. So a more mathematical argument uh, requires understanding on how, in general, you get uh, symmetries in quantum field theory. So in uh, so the crucial object which allows us to get symmetries in quantum field theory is uh, the crucial objects are the conserved currents, conserved cu local conserved current operators. In particular, if you are dealing with space-time symmetries, as we are dealing here, here with space-time symmetries, the crucial object for us is going to be the local stress tensor operator. So I told you that the easing model is going to contain not just two operators sigma and epsilon, but it's going to contain infinitely many operators. And here we go. Here I'm telling you that there's going to be one very important operator out of this infinite infinity of operators, and it is this local uh, conserved stress tensor operator, T minus of x. So what this operator, so let, let's, let's detail the properties of this operator. So first of all, as I said, uh, it's, uh, first of all, it's going to have dimension, the, the scaling dimension of this operator is going to be always equal to this full spatial, spatial dimension, D. So in our case, it's going to be equal to three. So this you may be familiar with that uh, in perturbation theory, one says that stress tensor does not get renormalized. So this is kind of a non-perturbative version of this statement. This can be justified in various ways, but let's just take it for now for granted. Uh, so another property that it has, it's symmetric. Symmetric tensor. Uh, so as I said, it's conserved. So T mu, D mu, T mu nu is equal to zero. So this is an operator equation. Operator equation, this means that uh, it's going to be valid in correlation functions apart from contact terms. So let me write it in more detail. So if you consider correlation function of, of this stress tensor operator with a bunch of other operators, one of x1 and so on, and we take the divergence of this correlation function, d mu, then this is going to be zero apart from contact terms. And let me write down these contact terms it's going to be equal to minus sum over uh, over these other points 
insertions i delta x minus x i let me just write it let me just write the first term minus delta x minus x1 d mu o1 of x1 and then all the other terms are not not changed x2 o2 of x2 and then of course there are corresponding terms for all other insertions. So it's a delta function times the same correlation function where the operator is replaced by its derivative. So this is what, what we call word identity. So this, this should be familiar, I hope, uh, just uh, reminding you. Any questions about this? And finally, uh, in the easing model, there's going to be an additional equation, which is very important, which is the trace. So this symmetric, this tensor is going to be traceless. T mu is equal to zero. And it is this last equation which will give rise to the special conformal transformation, to this k mu generator. For any higher dimensional conformal theory. So th this, in fact, is crucial equation which defines, uh, which implies conformal field theory. So this again is an operator equation, just like this. So it's valid away from other points. So now, what is the connection between the stress tensor and the symmetry of the theory? So we can obtain symmetry transformations by integrating the stress tensor. So the rule is the following. We have, we take, uh, so let's, let's first rem remember, uh, you know, this word identity, here I wrote it in the differential form, but there is a way to write this word identity in the integrated form. So let's, let's recall how it works. So I can, uh, I can consider the, I can take this word identity I, and I can integrate it. So the rule is the following. I take, I write P mu as an integral over some surface, let me call it sigma, uh, ds mu uh, t mu nu of x. So I have some surface and I integrate. So this surface that I'm going to integrate around, it's chosen in a way that it surrounds the, well, for example, it may surround the point x1. So here, which I have in my correlation function. So now, if I consider, uh, if I consider Here I have, I need more space, right? How am I sure? So this, this takes way too much space for what it represents. Let it be more economical. So if I take my correlation function t mu nu 
x or 1 of x1 dot dot dot. And if I integrate it, as I said, ds mu sigma, then if I now apply the Stokes theorem and uh, transform this surface integral into the volume integral, then I'm going to pick up this delta function and I'm going to get, well, let me put a minus sign here, uh, and I'm going to get that this is equal to d mu o1 of x1 dot dot dot. So what it means is that I can represent by integrating the stress tensor operator over a surface, I can reproduce the action of the momentum generator on my fields. So because remember that P mu, we had P mu O of X is equal D mu O. And here I obtained exactly the same action by integrating the stress tensor around the surface. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sorry. And here as well. So, by the way, notice that the shape of the surface does not matter because, again, I, I, can, deform, uh, I can deform the surface arbitrarily as long as it encloses the point x1. And since my stress tensor is conserved, the integral over the surface does not, uh, does not change. So this is what is called a topological surface operator sometimes. Topological <coughs> surface operator. So this is, yeah, this is, uh, this has many, many analogs and many names. So now, starting from this extremely well-known fact, I'm going to argue for the existence of this KMU generator. So this construction, what I want to say is that this construction is much more general than this. I can get all the other generators by integrating the stress tensor, but I should integrate the stress tensor times a vector field. So given, given a vector field epsilon nu, I can consider an operator Q epsilon, which is given by uh, integral uh, ds mu t mu nu epsilon nu, t mu nu of x epsilon nu of x. And I would like now to ask under what conditions this operator is a topological surface operator. Under which conditions can I deform my surface arbitrarily without changing the result? So if this topological condition is satisfied, it means that I have a symmetry in my theory. So well, this is clear. I have to check the condition that d mu of this acting on this has to give me zero because this was the condition which was responsible for, for the conservation of p mu. So d mu uh, t mu nu epsilon nu has to give me zero. And so this gives me uh, t mu nu so there is the first term, which is just the conservation of t mu nu. This, is, this drops out, so d mu t mu nu epsilon nu. So this is zero by itself, by the conservation, plus uh, t mu nu d mu epsilon nu. So this has to be equal to zero. 
Now, T mu nu is a symmetric tensor, is a symmetric traceless tensor. So I can rewrite this as uh, one half uh, T mu nu d mu epsilon nu plus d nu epsilon nu by symmetry. And now I see that T mu, t mu nu is traceless. So if this combination is proportional uh, to delta mu nu with no matter what factor, which can be x dependent in particular, then this is going to vanish. So this is going to be zero if conformal uh, Killing equation is satisfied. And so for every, uh, for every solution of the conformal Killing equation, I can construct this topological surface operator, which by the way sometimes is, is also called charge, uh, using the, the terminology of of the um, of quantum field theory and this is going to give me a symmetry of my theory so by symmetry I mean the following thing that uh, so th there are several things which this word implies but one uh, one property in particular which is very important for the symmetry is that if I act with the generator P mu on the field O at point X then in the right hand side I get a combination of fields and its derivatives at the same point X so it's, it acts locally right and this property the fact that it acts locally of course uh, it's very helpful to constrain uh, the, the symmetry but it also follows from the fact that the, the operator is topological because I can shrink this sphere to be arbitrarily small around the point X1 and so it's clear that the, resu the result of the action on the field O of X can only depend on fields around the point X. This is the, this is the reason why the action is, has to be local. So I think uh, I motivated and justified to some extent why uh, we are going to have for every uh, solution of conformal Killing equation a generator of symmetry on our quantum field theory. So if, if you have any questions, then please ask at this point. Yes. Uh, what does not happen? Uh, well, yeah, that's that's uh, the most famous and perhaps a unique case where it does happen. No, but, but I think the question was, so as I said, I, I tried to emphasize that this generator K mu, we kind of get it somewhat unexpectedly and for free. Where scale invariance implies conform invariance. And uh, uh, perhaps it was, uh, it was not uh, totally clear from my derivation, but the crucial condition which made everything work is the fact that T mu mu was equal to zero exactly zero now okay so now since you are asking I can I can uh, discuss this that in principle it's possible it's possible it's uh, logically conceivable that T mu mu uh, may be not exactly zero but can be a full derivative so d mu uh, v mu so if this is con if this condition is satisfied 
then you may have scale invariance without conformal invariance. It's not automatic, but you still have to check some things about Vimu, but in principle it's possible under this condition. Scale invariance without conformal invariance is possible. But uh, it's also clear that this is going to be extremely non-generic because in order for this to be true, you should have in your theory an operator V mu which has dimension exactly d minus 1 because t mu mu has dimension exactly d. So you should have this operator which has dimension exactly d minus 1, a vector operator. And, uh, and this is extremely non-generic because generically the only vector operators which have dimension d minus 1 are conserved currents. But if v mu is conserved, then d mu v mu is 0 and we get back to our situation. So basically, uh, basically, in all known interacting quantum field theories, this does not happen. So there is no operator Vmu, and consequently, scale invariance implies conformal invariance. But there are some examples of free quantum field theories where this operator Vmu exists, and in fact, they are scale invariant without conformal invariance. Yes. Sure, sure, exactly, yeah, yeah, so, so it depends, yeah, yeah, yeah so, okay, so in particular, in principle, you know, the easing model, you can try to simulate it on the lattice, and you can see on the lattice whether there is an operator of dimension d minus 1, dimension 2, vector operator of dimension 2. Uh, and uh, presumably you will find that there is no such operator. This this kind of an easy way uh, to to see if the theory uh, has conformal invariance or not. Yes. So, uh, mm, 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 mm. so, so the question is, uh, you know, how you define operators in the continuum limit? That's that's what you mean. Uh, well, yeah, I, I I was supposing that this was familiar, but I, of course I should explain if if this is not familiar. So. Um, So let me uh, let me let me say a few things about that, um, and then we will make a break. Actually, uh, are there other people who who are uh, who would like to know the answer to this question? Raise your hand if you want to know the answer to this question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, that's uh, that's good. Thanks. Uh, no, I mean, if there are so many people, I better explain this now quickly, and then we'll make a break. So, uh, so we, we need to go to the basics. We need to go to the RG theory of of, uh, of Wilson. So, in RG theory of Wilson, we we have this randomization group transformation, and it acts on the Hamiltonian, and uh, at the fixed point, it gives back the Hamiltonian, right? That's is that fine? This equation is clear. Now, uh, so this gives you the fixed point, but it does not tell you yet uh, what are the local operators. So, in order to uh, to define the local operators, you have to consider, uh, you have to linearize this equation. You have to perturb it. So, h plus delta h. So, it's going to be equal to h plus something, 
<coughs> now, for very particular delta H's, this linearization is going to give you back the same delta H times a constant. So this is a sort of eigenvalue equation for the randomization group transformation linearized around the fixed point. So, so delta H is going to be very, very particular. Not any, not any, every delta H is going to satisfy this equation. Now, uh, the, the local operator, so then we say that every such delta H is going to be associated uh, with the local operator. So it's going to have the form integral of some local operator of a particular scaling dimension delta uh, times ddx. And the eigenvalue in this equation, lambda, is going to be equal to delta minus d. No, sorry, d minus delta. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, let's, let me take this small delta. Yeah. So, so the eigenvalue of this equation is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the scaling dimension of the operator. So, uh, now back to your question. So you said in the easing model we have these operators SI. And so what is the relation between SI and the operator sigma of x? Of course, sigma of x is not going to be equal to SI. But uh, there's going to be a relation of the form sigma of x is going to be equal to SI plus a whole bunch of terms, infinitely many terms, which are going to be of the form uh, S cube, uh, S to the fifth, so basically all terms allowed by the symmetry with very particular coefficients. So you have to adjust all these coefficients in such a way that the eigenvalue equation be satisfied. So in terms of randomization group, it's extremely messy to solve this equation. Of course, you can do it in perturbation theory in some particular frameworks, but if you want to do it really on the lattice, it's extremely messy. So if we do, when we do conformal field theory, we bypass this step. We say, uh, let's suppose that we already did all this mess and we arrived at the continuum limit with operators which have nice scale transformation properties, nice scaling dimensions, and let's just work with this beautiful and clean mathematical objects. So. It's, it's very appealing uh, aesthetically because you say, well, fixed points are uh, very constrained, very unique, very rigid objects. So it's not clear why should you study the, the fixed points by flowing to them through some messy lattice Hamiltonians and so on. That's very unappealing. It's much more appealing to say that, well, since the fixed points are so constrained, I should be able to focus on them and to think about them uh, directly in terms of the uh, properties of the fixed point itself. And that's what CFT is about. Yes. Spins on different sides, yeah, on nearby sides. Yes, 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 yes. You mean why does it have to be represented in this form? Well, this is just a name. I mean, I can, so this is going to, there's going to be some density. Well, so let me call the density O of x. Uh, 
So basically, uh, you are the question is the following. So here we will have terms like S i, uh, for example, here we will have S i, S i one, S i one, S i two. And here, in principle, I'm supposed to sum over all points i one, i two with some coefficients. And the coefficients uh, they're not not going to be necessarily close. To, to the point i. So there is an assumption here that it's true that this is go there's going to be some non-locality, so these coefficients are going to have some spread, but there is an assumption that this spread is going to go to zero at large distances. It is, it is kind of an assumption, yeah. So uh, in fact, um, yeah, it is kind of an assumption. Yes, yeah, so it is an ass it it is an assumption that uh that you can post factum verify, yeah, so for consistency. But uh I think there are mm, some subtle situations in statistical physics where this may break down. I think we should make a break. Uh how, how many ten minutes? Ten minutes break. Okay. So, um, okay. Okay, so we spent some time talking about this uh, conformal generator K mu, which is associated with the vector field uh, 2x mu minus x squared d mu. So, so I wanted to say one thing about how should you think about this vector field. Th there is a nice way to think about this vector field. So there is, if you think about the vector field p mu, which is d mu, so you can think about this vector field as the vector field which uh, moves the origin but keeps infinity fixed. It keeps infinity fixed basically because infinity is very far away. So if you shift by a constant, then nothing, uh, nothing changes. But on the other hand, this vector field k mu, you see it, it vanishes at x equal to zero, right? So it, it fixes uh, the origin. But on the other hand, it grows very quickly quadratically at x going to infinity. So it, it moves infinity. So it has this opposite uh, it has this opposite uh, structure with respect, with respect to p mu. And actually, this can be formalized uh, by the following equation. So let's consider the inversion transformation. So inversion transformation moves, takes the point x mu and maps it to x mu over x squared. So in particular, it interchanges 0 and infinity. So, so this inversion transformation is a conformal transformation. Um, you know, you can check this that it's a conformal transformation. So it, it does satisfy this uh, property that it's a com it's Jacobian is a, a composition of um, dilatation and rotation. Actually, check this is an exercise to check that it's conformal transformation. But there is a difference. So this conformal transformation is different from all the other transformations that we discussed uh, because it cannot be continuously connected to the identity. So all the other transformations are the ones which are you can obtain by exponentiating these generators that we discussed. 
but this you will never get uh, a transformation of this form which interchanges zero and infinity so it's disconnected component of the conformal group but if you apply the, inver the if you apply the inversion twice then you get back into the connected component and so the following equation is true that you can get k mu by taking inversion uh, applying p mu and falling again by inversion I think up to the mi up to a minus sign so again this is an exercise so this explains why this interchanged role of zero and infinity and it also explains post factum why k mu is a conformal transformation because p mu is obviously conformal inversion is conformal so if you apply it a composition then you again get conformal so <coughs> So now that we know all the conformal transformations, then a natural thing to do is to consider the algebra of conformal transformations. So, uh, you know, given the first thing to do would be to consider the algebra of the vector fields. Right? So we, have, we know all the vector fields, so we can consider uh, transformations of the uh, algebra of these uh, vector fields. And this gives you an algebra so you can work out all the commutation relations by, uh, by by usual things so it's going to give you an algebra of conformal transformations <coughs> so there are a bunch of commutators involving just m mu nu and p mu those are uh, obvious this is just Poincaré. And then there are some commutators involving D, and there are some commutators involving K mu. And actually, uh, the, uh, the interesting commutators that I'm going to write down here so D P mu is equal P mu, uh, D K mu is equal minus K mu and uh, uh, k mu p nu is equal uh, twice delta mu d minus <coughs> twice m mu nu. So as I said, to work out this algebra, you just start with vector fields and you use the usual bracket of Lie bracket of vector fields and you get this algebra of conformal transformations. By the way, uh, you know, this is a finite dimensional algebra and so we know all finite dimensional algebras. So you can ask, you know, at, at the level of classification of algebras, what is this algebra? And actually, the answer is that this algebra written in this form, uh, it's not clear, but you can find, you can transform, find some linear combinations of generators. And this algebra is actually nothing but S O D plus one comma one. <coughs> so it's an algebra of Lorentz transformations in uh, D plus two dimensional space. So you can check the, the, that the number of generators is the same and uh, also all commutation relations are the same. So this you can read about in my notes and I'm going to say a few more uh, words about it later on. Mm. But now the following uh, interesting question arises. So this algebra, I computed it completely classically just by starting from vector fields. But now we are doing quantum field theory. 
So the question is, what is going to be the algebra of charges in quantum field theory? And uh, the answer is that it's going to be the same, exactly the same algebra. So the reason why I'm, I'm uh, stressing this fact is perhaps uh, since uh, many of you are familiar with the two-dimensional conformal field theory, uh, you may remember that in two-dimensional conformal field theory, you start with the uh, algebra of vector fields. But when you go to the quantum field theory, then you end up with the Virasor algebra, which is a central deformation of the algebra of vector fields. So there is, uh, there is a new parameter, the central charge, which appears, and the commutation relations get modified uh, involving this uh, central charge. But now you, you should also remember uh, the following fact, uh, that the term which involves the central charge, it's uh, something like C. So this comment is only for those who are familiar with uh, two-dimensional uh, with two-dimensional CFT. So there is this term which involves the center charge and this term vanishes when n is equal to 0, 1 or minus 1. So there is this SL2C subalgebra of the Virasor algebra which is in fact the algebra of global conformal transformations which is the analog on 2D of the algebra that we are discussing here. And so this central extension does not affect at all in two dimensions the SL2C. So analogously in higher dimensions there is no central extension. So this algebra of global conformal transformations gets completely unmodified at uh, the quantum level. Yes. There's there's no no Uh, no, no, uh, there is a while anomaly in, 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 uh, in even dimensional space times, but, uh, but this, uh, uh, this while anomaly manifests itself in, uh, in, in different, in different ways through, uh, but not at the level of the algebra in, uh, not at the level of the algebra in flat space time. And the reason why there is no central extension is simply because this algebra is finite dimensional and finite dimensional algebras are rigid. You cannot deform them. It's only, so the reason why there is an issue of deformation in two dimensions in Virasor because that's an infinite dimensional algebra and in that case, sometimes there are deformations, there are central extensions. But for finite dimensional algebras, there is no issue. So this algebra is uh, also in quantum theory uh, it's going to be uh, this algebra. Again, this can be this can be justified additionally in many other ways, but for us, this is this argument is going to be sufficient. Uh, and now, uh, so since since this is the algebra, uh, so I started the whole discussion by writing the commutation relation of. P mu acting on fields, M mu nu acting on fields, and also I wrote how the dilatation generator acts on fields. But now the question becomes how K mu acts on fields. So we, have, we still have to find this out. This I have not written yet. And uh, it acts in a more difficult way. And uh, in order to understand how it acts, uh, the first observation is the following. That uh, let's first ask the following question. Let's, meet, let, let's take K mu and apply Uh, 
at a field, at a certain field sitting at zero. And let's suppose that this field has a dimension delta. The question is, what is going to be the dimension of terms in the right-hand side? So, uh, by analogy, if, if, if I act, if I take a field of dimension delta and act on it with P mu, then I'm going to get D mu O, and D mu O has dimension delta plus one, right? We know this without doing any, any calculation. But how do you see it from the algebra? Well, you see it from the algebra from this commutation relation. No, the fact that uh, d p mu equals p mu, the fact that p mu is, a, is an eigenvector of the dilatation generator with eigenvalue 1, it means that p mu raises the dimension, the scaling dimension of the field by 1. Right, so here means that p mu is a raising operator. This is in the same way as we analyze the, uh, the structure of angular momentum representations in quantum mechanics and so on. On the other hand, if you look at the commutation relation with k mu, you see that k mu is a lowering operator because it has eigenvalue minus one. And in fact, if you, if, you go, if you go back to these expressions of the vector fields, you already see why this is the case. Because p mu was a derivative, while k mu involves two powers of x, which lower the dimension by two units, so from one it becomes one mi minus one. Right? So k mu is a lowering operator, and it means that if you act with k mu on any operator d of dimension d, delta square, sorry, you are going to get here uh, something of dimension uh, delta minus 1. So this is the first observation. But now, now let's do the following exercise. So let's just take any operator of our theory, and let's keep acting on it with k mu. You know, you act once, you act twice, and you every time you act, you lower the dimension. But you know that in, in, uh, in any quantum field theory, the dimensions of operators are typically bounded from below. You cannot have operators of arbitrarily negative dimension. Well, actually, typically, you only have operators of positive dimension. It's because... If you take an operator of negative dimension, if you take it uh, far away, then the correlation function grows with distance. But you know, in, in uh, usually in physical situations, correlation function decays with distance. So, the, so typically, I'm not being rigorous here, but this is going to do. So typically, well, actually, in all examples that I'm aware of, the dimensions are bounded from from below by some minimal dimension. And it means that if you keep acting with k mu on op an operator, you sooner or later are going to hit zero. So you cannot get something of negative, of arbitrary negative dimension. So, is this clear? Yes, but I took it at point zero. So here there cannot be x mu. Exactly. If it were at a point x, then you would be completely right. But here I took it at zero, so x cannot enter. Uh, so it means that uh, you're going to hit zero. And so this shows that among all operators of my, uh, of my CFT, there's going to be a, a privileged class of operators namely those annihilated by k mu. So I'm going to consider 
I'm going to consider operators. Uh, such that k mu o delta of zero equals zero. And these are going to be called primary operators. So uh, now you see where I'm going. So I said conformal filter is going to contain infinitely many operators. But now I'm going to split these infinitely many operators into groups, which are called multiplets, conformal multiplets. Every conformal multiplet has at its bottom a primary operator. And then I can take a primary operator and I can act with it on it with p mu, with derivatives. So uh, the operators that I get from the primary operator by acting on it with derivatives are going to have dimension larger than uh, larger than delta, delta plus one, delta plus two, delta plus three, and so on. Those are not going to be primary operators. Those are going to be called descendants. So from O delta, so from O delta, I'm going to get uh, by acting with p mu, I'm going to get d mu o, then d mu d nu o. So these are all operators which are called descendants. And the whole thing is called conformal multiplet. So uh, so you see, physically, it's very natural because I don't care so much about these derivative operators. I mean, clearly, they are not uh, fundamental. So the fundamental operators are those ones can, which cannot be represented as, as derivatives of anyone. So if I compute correlation functions of primary operators, then correlation functions of all the other operators are just derivatives, so not so interesting. So in particular, these operators sigma and operator epsilon in the three-dimensional easy model, they are uh, going to be primary operators, of course. And uh, the stress tensor is going to be a primary operator. And in general, there's going to be infinitely many primary operators in any conformal field theory in three dimensions, in D dimensions. Um, Any questions about this? Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That was that was what I was about to say. Yeah. So it's still interesting to say what, what k mu does when it's applied to O of x. But let's suppose O is a primary. So we said that you know, we don't care so much about descendants. Let's just focus on primary. And what is this? But this can be computed from the algebra because I can, I can write O of x as uh, e to the px O of 0 e to the minus px. And now just by using the uh, the, the algebra and using the, the Hausdorff, the Campbell Baker Hausdorff formula, I can express this in terms of uh, things that I know. So this is completely fixed now using the algebra. And uh, this this gives me uh, this gives me small k mu, which is this uh, vector field, plus 
2 delta x mu <coughs> minus 2 x mu times uh, uh, 2 x nu, sorry, s mu nu. Here again, uh, this x on the indices times O of x. So this is just a calculation. So that's it. I know uh, I know how my whole algebra uh, of conformal generators acts on all my primary fields. So it means that I should be in a position to formulate the conditions for the conformal invariance. So as I said, conformal invariance is going to imply some constraints on the correlation functions of the theory in the same way as Lorentz invariance just tells you that correlation functions in the theory are, you know, depends only on uh, uh, on distances in the Lorentz invariant way. So here there's going to be an analog of this statement. So let's let me write it uh, let me write it down. Well, actually, I can already write it down. So the, uh, the this statement is going to say that, so if I take any correlation function, let me take O of O1 of X1, ON of XN. So these are primary operators. And I act on this correlation function with LA, where LA is any generator of the conformal group. So what does this mean in practice? It means that I have to take the following sum. LA O1 of X1, O2 X2, ON XN, plus, so I have to act with this generator on any field. O1 of X1, LA, O two x two dot 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 plus dot 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 and this has to give me zero. So this is the condition that I have to solve. And each of these terms L A O one X one I gave you as a certain differential operator as a certain differential operator. For example, for the dilatation generator it was uh, remember, you know, for, for K mu it's this. So th th these are some constraints on correlation functions, clearly, right? But it's also clear that in this form, it's totally, <laughs> it's totally untransparent. You know, if we had to analyze consequences of conformal invariance starting from here, it would be a mess, a total mess. So uh, I'm not going to do this. What I have to explain now is that how, what is the simple and efficient way to extract the physical content of this constraint. Any any questions about yeah? No, what, what do you mean by constructive? That depends on your definition. Well, uh, yes, that's what this whole course is about. So that's, uh, you know, eventually we are going to formulate some system of equations and say that critical points have to satisfy these equations and using these equations you can make concrete predictions about this critical point or that critical point. Whether 
a complete classification is possible or not? This is an open question, but it's of course on everyone's mind. Yeah, we, we hope it is possible, but it's an open problem. Uh, there is no analog of minimal model. Yeah, there's no. Analog. I'm I'm going to comment on this uh, later on. There's no known analog of minimal model. But you see, minimal models are are a fluke in a sense in 2D, because you know minimal models have a central charge less than one. If you go to central charge larger than one in 2D, there's no classification. Even in 2D. Very little is known about classification of conformal field theories of center of charge larger than one. And if you do uh, CFT in D larger than two, then you are morally in the same situation as 2D with center of charge larger than one. We have a few minutes, so. Uh, so the first step, so we have to simplify this condition, as I said. And the first step uh, to simplifying this condition is uh, to express it in terms of finite transformations as opposed to infinitesimal transformations. So let me, uh, let me say how this works. So, uh, so for for every vector field epsilon, uh, we associated this uh, charge Q epsilon for every conformal vector field. Now let us consider a finite transformation F, which is uh, obtained by exponentiating this epsilon. Right? Then analogously, we can consider uh, exponentiating the charge, so we are going to get this transformation u, which is e to the q epsilon. And the question is, how does this u act on the field x, on the field at the point x? So I already gave you one example. For example, I said that uh, I said that for for the dilatation, you know, for Translations, we know the answer. For the translations, this is just uh, uh, u of x plus a for translations, right? It's 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 trivial, right? For uh, Lorentz transformations, it's also trivial. For dilatations, I gave you the answer. So the only non-trivial question is uh, what's the answer for special conformal transformations, and uh, whether we can find some formula which ni nicely encapsulates all transformation properties under all of this conformal group. And such a formula exists, so let me write it down for you. Uh, exactly so. Uh, yeah, so let me write it down. Exactly, you are, you are right, you are totally right. So. So I introduced this Jacobian dx prime, dx uh, dx prime mu dx nu equals uh, some function omega of x times uh, some matrix r mu nu, which is an orthogonal matrix. And now this uh, this this formula in general looks as follows. So if my field has a uh, has an index a, then I have here uh, omega of x to the power delta times, so here, th this is the only non-trivial part. So if, if my field has indices, then, uh, so if my field transforms in some representation of the rotation group, then there's going to be this uh, matrix D, which depends on the representation uh, of x and OB of O A of X, O B of X. So that's all. So you see, this formula 
is an extremely simple generalization, the most natural generalization in the sense of, uh, you know, for dilatation generator, we had this factor and omega was a constant. And we did not have this because, uh, because in that case, there was no rotation in the internal space. For Lorentz transformations, omega is equal to one, but of course there is this factor. And so for general conformal transformations, you just put these two things together in the most natural way and you get the formula. So in fact, I could have skipped uh, these two hours and I could have started my lectures from, uh, from this equation. So I didn't do this because, uh, because I wanted to, to be to explain you where this all comes from, right? So, but now, uh, now that's it. So now I have to say that, so I can rewrite this. So this is going to be the last equation I'm going to write today. So uh, I have the following. So this is, this U is a symmetry, so I have uh, O1 of X1, uh, ON of XN. Sorry, here I, I wrote X. This has to be, of course, X prime, sorry. This is uh, X going to X prime equals F of X. Sorry, th this, is, this is very important, this is X prime. So this is equal to Mm, omega of x1 to the power uh, delta 1 times this, let me call this matrix D1, uh, omega of x2 to the power delta 2 times D2 dot 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 times O1 at the point x1 prime or n at the point xn prime. So this is the the condition which has to be satisfied by correlation functions in any uh, conformal field theory. Yeah, so this is for primary fields. I think I'll... Uh, so as we will see in the next lecture, this can be simplified even further, but I think I should stop here. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, what, w you know, sometimes you can call this field O prime of X. But you see the field O prime of X is obtained out of O by this transformation U, which is a symmetry. So, so if you insert here U, U minus first, U, U minus first, all these U's cancel, and so the correlation function does not change. You have to assume that the vacuum is also invariant under, under the conformal transformation. So, and this is very important because you want to have a correlation function in the left-hand side and the right-hand side exactly the same because otherwise if, if these, are, these have to be correlation functions of the same fields in order to get a non-trivial constraint. So, so these are the same correlation functions but at two different points. You see here I have x1 prime, xn prime and here I have x1, xn. So conformal transformation tells you that you can move points around and correlation function doesn't change, provided that you rescale by these factors, omega factors. Right. Uh, so. Okay, then we go for a break.